Thanks to Paul and Elizabeth for those reassuring words. And here are some other reassuring words from Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us who also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus, in order that in coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Jesus, Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. A couple weeks ago, we started the Believe series as we're going through the Bible and talking about the basics of faith, the very foundations of our faith. And it's, the response has been very good. I, uh, sometimes I, I think that, well, this is, this is basic. We all know this. But sometimes hearing it again or hearing it in a different way or it's where you are in your journey of faith that something finally clicks, that uh, these all make these make sense. So two weeks ago, we answered the question, why we believe in God, why we believe God actually exists. And last week, Michael told us that it's personal, that not only does God exist, but it can be a personal relationship with each one of us. God in both being transcendent above a creation, but also eminent, intimately involved in creation, which includes us, each one of us. An amazing ability of God to know each one of us that we can have a personal relationship with God, all of humanity, every single one of us. And today we talk about the salvation, about the need to be saved. Now, lots of people don't want to talk about this. In Christian circles, it's kind of understood that Jesus saves us and salvation is from God through Jesus, but it isn't an automatic thing. Our relationship with God isn't automatic. We don't just automatically have this relationship with God that's intimate and personal. It takes, as all relationships do, a meeting and a sharing time together and continuing to walk with each other and spending time together and experiencing life together. And it can happen a lot of different ways. It's one thing to have a pen pal it's another thing to actually meet the person. You can communicate and have a relation with the exchange of letters, or today, Skyping, that's even better. Uh, all those means of communication, but it's something quite different than to actually get to meet the person face to face. I shared that uh, a few weeks ago when I got to talk about uh, Leroy Stutz, who I'd heard about from the Vietnam War experience being a POW, and then actually getting to meet him uh, in real life, real person, and actually talk with him and actually pray for and minister to him. Uh, to actually meet Leroy was better than just knowing about him. 
relationship is something done in the context of uh, shared experience. In the beginning of humanity, God had a close and unhindered relationship with Adam and Eve. It was the way it was supposed to be. In the beginning, God's presence and humanity was all they could walk, as it says in the Bible, in the cool of the evening together. They could share life together. That's what God has always had in mind. Then Adam and Eve chose to go their own way. Adam and Eve chose, in essence, to be God themselves rather than do the one thing God told them they couldn't do. I mean, this is crazy. God only told them one thing that they couldn't do. They could do everything else. And they chose to say, well, we know what's good enough for us. We'll do it anyway. And it's all been downhill since then, except that God is redeeming humanity. And now there's hope for us. When Jesus came, there's hope. From the very beginning of that fall with Adam and Eve and paradise was lost, even the creation itself was affected and God immediately set to redeem and restore creation, including human beings. There became an estrangement between humanity and God, but God never gave up on us. And that's his way with us now. He never gives up on us. No matter what we've done, no matter how bad we've been, no matter what our situation is right now, God is yearning to be in relationship with you, wants to take you right where you are and love you. And he'll want you to be molded and shaped into the likeness of his son, but it's all good. You are, he receives you right where you are. You don't have to prove yourself to him first. He loves you. But Adam and Eve went and thrown away. And there began then a condition of what theologians call original sin. You may have heard of it. Uh, it has different ideas behind it, but as I tried to distill it down, the definition for it out of the Handbook of Theological Terms is a universal and hereditary sinfulness of man since the fall of Adam. It seems like the best we can explain it is that when Adam and Eve sinned, sin came into all of humanity all the way through. It's like we're born with it. It says it's hereditary. It's a sinfulness that we just seem to do. And we don't know where it came from in us. It's just kind of who we are. We're created good. We're good creation by God's own hand. And then there's this corrupting influence that keeps us from doing what we should do. It's different from actual sin, those things that we consciously do to rebel against God or live contrary to God's ways. But it's as Reinhold Niebuhr put it, it's an inevitability. There's an inevitability about our sinning. It's like we can't help not do it as hard as we try sometimes. And that's why the Apostle Paul, uh, when he writes uh, in Romans chapter 7, this is Paul who had done miracles. He had healed people, uh, just uh, unbelievable miracles. And sometimes he says to mighty acts of God done through us, uh, great visions, even caught up to the seventh heaven, perhaps bodily, he says. He's not really sure, in the spirit at least. And he still stopped, talked about struggling with sin. Oh, wretched man that I am, he writes redeemed, restored, God working mightily through him, and he still acknowledges that there is this tendency to do what God doesn't want done. And he ends that chapter with some thanks be to God in Jesus Christ who saves us. And then he starts chapter 8 with, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We're not condemned, but God has so much more for us. So how do we explain this hereditary inevitability? It's, uh, I'm trying to think of an example. You maybe feel it warring in yourself when you've got an addiction or a temptation or a, a bad habit that you just have a hard time getting over. Uh, you can do like Colonel Potter uh, from the MASH series that, as he's talking with Radar and said, son, because Radar is wondering if smoking cigars was addictive. And Colonel Potter responds, son, I've been smoking these for 50 years and never got the habit. You can go that way and say, no, I don't have a problem. Or you can get it that this is a really difficult thing to do sometimes, to kick a habit or to, 
to not be that way that seems like I've always been, a character flaw in me that always seems to get in the way. One guy said, you know, babies really convince you of original sin. He was talking about how his son, it was, I don't know, nine months old or something, young, was, he walked in and there the son had crawled up on the kitchen table and gotten the carton of chocolate milk, was down on the floor and just had it everywhere, I'm sorry. Just had it, you know, in the hair and smeared over the thing on the floor and just this pool of chocolate ice cream, I'm sorry. Uh, and he, he just walked in and said, man, that's original sin right there, you know. <laughs> It's that sense of, I want what I want, and I want it now. And that's basically what Adam and Eve did. They wanted what they wanted to do. Even God said, you, you, just, you got it all, just don't do this one. And they went and did that one. Even though God was walking with them, they still found a way to do it. But we want what we want. You ever heard about the terrible twos? You, you, you may not, your kids may not go through that. I don't think, uh, we didn't have that with some of our kids, and we did with others, and just stages and things, and, but people say, oh, yeah, the terrible twos. That's where the kid learns that he can tell you no, just like you can tell him no. And they begin to tell you no, back at you, because they want what they want, now. And they can't believe that you won't give it to them, so they throw a tantrum to try to convince you that you ought to do it. And how we parent in those times is real important. And then there's the teenage years. Ever have anybody say, oh boy, wait till they get to be teenagers. Now you think the terrible twos are bad, wait till they get to be teenagers. Then they begin to reason with you and, yeah, sometimes catch you in your own logic or illogic, as the case may be. And even as adults, I'm not sure we really shake it because we still want what we want when we want it. We think our way is the best way. We, we want it and we don't like it when other people don't give it to us or they do something that's contrary to what we want. There's that, I want it my way. Original sin, it's that tendency to want to be God. But God's plan of salvation was immediate. Man, as soon as things happened in the garden, God started to set about saving humanity. And God does it, but we couldn't do ourselves. It's like we just never really get it together. Otherwise, you'd think somebody would have. But the Bible, the record of the Bible is that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. All of us has turned to our own way. We're all in need of God doing something to get us back. And God does in Jesus Christ. God, the second person of the Godhead, as theologians would talk about that, steps into humanity. John will write that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That God came into, stepped into humanity in both this, this mystery of being both fully God and fully human. Jesus does what we couldn't do. He who lived a sinless life goes to the cross. He who should never have died because he didn't sin offered himself as that perfect sacrifice, the per perfect payment for the penalty of our sin. And on him was the chastisement that made us whole, Isaiah writes in 53. By his wounds and his stripes we are healed, Isaiah would prophesy of Jesus. John will say that he died to cleanse us from all unrighteousness by the shedding of his blood. Jesus did it for us. And so it shows God's mercy where God says, yes, you are guilty. You want to you wanna be God. You want to go your own way. You want what you want. But I'm not going to give you the wrath that you deserve, spoken of in the passage that was read. And so God says, I'm not, in his mercy, says I'm not going to punish you and mercy, by definition, is not getting what you deserve. You deserve to be punished. You did it. You're guilty. You deserve the punishment. But God says, I'm not doing that. And then because his justice has to be done, God steps in and pays the debt himself. That's what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus took our punishment. Jesus took our death. Jesus bore our sins upon himself. He paid the penalty because the wages of sin is death. A price had to be paid. But Jesus takes it free. But then he, so we're, we're set free. Jesus dies our death. We get to live. 
But God doesn't say we're done. God goes another step further. Not only has he shown us mercy and his justice has been taken care of, God shows us his graciousness. And he says, not only are you free from death, but I want to adopt you as my kids. I want to welcome you into my family. You're guilty, you are bad, but I paid the price and I also want to welcome you into my family. It doesn't just say, okay, you're, you're clean and <laughs> kick you out on the streets and you're on your own now. He says, yeah, I paid the price and I want you as my kids. I want you as my family. And that happens for us as a free gift by God's grace. It's a free gift to us offered to us without price. Adoption is God's kids freely offered. We just have to say yes. Because another thing about God, he loves you so much, he's going to give you the choice whether you want to love God back. And that's why loving Jesus is so important because a, a really transformed life happens when we say yes back to God who's already said yes to us. God's already said yes to you. God's already said the offer of eternal life is for you to have. I want it for you. You can have it. I want you to have it. But we can say, like Adam and Eve, no, I, I think I got it. I'm good. Um, I just, I, I'd rather do it my way. God will never give up on trying to say, oh, no, shoot. No, you get, see, that, that doesn't work well for you. That doesn't go well when you do that. God loves us so much. He'll never give up on drawing us and luring us and trying to get in relationship with us. But it's our choice. We can say no. We can throw a tantrum and say, no, I don't want anybody doing that for me. Love's got to be on my terms. Our front of our bulletin actually is a good representation. Those of you going through the uh, disciples' path will kind of recognize the heart that the transformation uh, the, the picture is of, uh, of course, Jesus for life is a great, <laughs> a great phrase. But in the disciples' path, it'll have the one side of the heart is our belief in Jesus. We believe in him. And the second part is our action. Both of those making a heart geared towards transformation. The real transformation is to believe in Jesus and to act then as Jesus acts, to love people as Jesus loved. Acts 4.12 is that verse, key verse for us today. And I just want to read it for us. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to humanity by which we must be saved. This is the message of the early church. This is the message after they were filled with the Holy Spirit and given power, that Jesus is the way of salvation. There's no other salvation. It's Jesus freely offered, freely given. The changed life happens. The new creation can occur when we welcome Jesus in, accept that we need to be saved, and then walk with him in real relationship. And Ephesians then, in the second chapter, our key verse for today, verses 8 and 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works so that nobody can boast. It's a wonderful thing. God has saved you. It's a free gift for you to receive. We don't earn it. We can't earn it. We can't work for it. It's a gift of God. By God's graciousness, through faith in what Jesus has done on the cross. We believe that that's what salvation, how salvation happens. So what do we do with this? Jesus is the key. Real faith is needed. And everyone is somebody that needs to be saved and in Christ is saved. And we get to accept that and receive a free gift of eternal life. Today, let's just pray together. Lord, thank you so much for saving us. Thank you so much for removing our sin, both original sin and our actual individual sins. Those things that just break our relationship with you. 
Forgive us for those times that we have failed you. Forgive us for not seeking you more earnestly. And thank you for never giving up on us. Thank you for your loving kindness, your graciousness that gives us what we don't deserve. Thank you for welcoming us. Lord, make yourself real to us. And if we haven't ever really asked you into our heart, may this be the day, the day of salvation. May this be the day that we just say, Lord, I don't have all the answers, but I know I need you. Come into my life. Help me with my life. When things are going good, help me know to do with the goodness that you've lavished upon us, to bless others. Lord, reveal yourself to us today in a new way. Nudge our hearts. Renew our minds. May we sense the eternity that you have placed in our hearts. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us with the presence of the risen Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord. May we show it in how we live. May we return the graciousness that you have placed upon us, return it into the lives of others. You're the best. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand it for the closing prayer if you're able. Now may the God of all graciousness, who has lavished upon you loving kindness and mercy, bless you to the very core of your being with his presence. May the Holy Spirit work within you that you may be a true disciple of Jesus Christ all the days of your life, and that even from this hour forward you will live a life that is different and changed, not just by your efforts, but because he is at work in you. Praise God for your salvation. Show his peace and joy to all those around you. Go in his peace and his strength. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.